I, uh, I think we, because we're timed to the minute, um, because Elizabeth Barlow, who organizes these things, always times us to the minute, and we're already two minutes late, and she's looking at her watch. I'm going to start, even though people are still coming in. My name's David Weald. Um, most of you know me. I'm the director of the ESRC Center, Inogen Center, until March next year, when we finally run out of money after... 11 years or so, um, and I've got two jobs right now which should only take me about five minutes, uh, five minutes and no seconds, according to Elizabeth. I've got to briefly do two things, uh, as well as introducing the chair. Um, I'd like, first of all, to thank a number of institutions and people who've been very, very important to the success of the ESRC Inogen Centre and have supported us over the last decade or so. And first, I'd like to start with the Economic and Social Research Council. To have 10 years of funding is a, a huge, a huge thing. It's a massive privilege for a group of researchers to get 10 years of funding. Personally, it's six years more funding than I've ever had in my whole rather long career. The longest grant I ever had before the Inogen grant was a, a three and three quarter year grant. So 10 years is incredible. Um, and Adrian Alsop is, uh, is representing the ESRC today. And I'd like to thank Adrian, who's been with us for the whole 10, 11 years, and his colleagues most, most sincerely for their ongoing support since 2002, support which, core support which has totaled about seven and a half million pounds. Second, I want to thank our two institutional bases, the University of Edinburgh and the Open University here. Their support has been uh, continuous, extremely generous, and continues into our third five-year period, which began in 2012 and continues to 2017. I wanted just to pick out one person, Andy Lane, who's in the audience, uh, who was the Dean of Technology um, when the ESRC Centre was funded. And um, this was the very first ESRC Centre the Open University has had. And we'd be getting letters from, uh, phone calls from the ESRC from Ros Rouse at the ESRC saying things like, you do realize what a large grant means, what a big investment means. And we'd kind of look at each other a bit and say, yes, of course we know. But it was Andy who turned that, yes, of course we know what to do as a university with a large grant into what we actually did. He was the person who got our premises who arranged with the Open University Administrative System for us to become a part of that system. It was no mean feat, so I wanted, I wanted Andy to be here and to remember that we should remember what he did for us. The OU has been very generous in a number of things, but I wanted just to pinpoint one thing. The OU has, has funded actually 10 PhD studentships. A lot of those PhD students, how many are here who were funded by the Open University as PhD students? One, two, three, four, there are 10 altogether. Out of the, the Open University has successfully graduated 18 PhD students in Inogen out of the 36 of the Open University in Edinburgh. And 10 of those were funded directly by the Open University. That's huge support. They've also been very important in levering funding as well. So I wanted to thank the Open University. Third, in thanking all our collaborators, hundreds of them, I just wanted to mention Joyce Tate, um, who was the first director of the ESRC Centre from 2002 to 2007. Now, Joyce and Joanna Chataway, who's here in the front, um, had ideas about a centre like this centre quite a long time before we got that centre, when Joyce was at the Open University. And uh, these two incredibly strong women knew what they wanted. And I suspect um, these strong women, and let me thank Joyce, did, were the ones who actually got the ESRC Centre to Edinburgh and the Open University. So we should all be thanking Joyce and continue to thank Joyce because she's certainly not stopped and she's not stopping yet, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so thanks to all of those. We think... Certainly the amount of funding that the Inogen Centre has had over time is, is over 20 million. 
of which 7.5 comes as core funding. And that's a huge achievement. And that comes from many, many people within the Energen Centre. So thanks to all of those. Really finally, thanks to Elizabeth Barlow, who organised today, to Angela Walters, who organised from the OU, and to Peter Robbins, who had to put up with frantic phone calls from Edinburgh quite often, saying, is it all OK? Will it all happen? My second task is a commercial. Uh, and after this very short commercial, I'm going to pass straight over to Chris Walkup, who's at the front here. He's kindly agreed to chair today's proceedings. Chris is uh, on our advisory board, has been on our advisory board for a number of years now, and he's the director of the UK Biosciences Knowledge Transfer Network, which is one of the technology strategy board's networks for gaining impact from UK biosciences. It's, it's I think, the biggest in the biosciences. Um, and the, the other interesting piece of um, information, I think, about Chris is that he links Edinburgh and the Open University rather well because uh, the Biosciences Knowledge Transfer Network is based in Edinburgh, but Chris actually lives a mile away from where we are today. Uh, his house is in Milton Keynes, so he was probably the one who had to travel uh, least distance to get here. But before he comes up to chair, small commercial... We were trying to work out how to present Inogen's research without boring you over years and months. And, and so one of the ways we do that is after we finish, you can go out and you can see the posters and publications and so on. Um, but also we wanted to give us a little bit of a sense of what we do and what makes us tick and what makes us so excited about our research. And that includes the open university research, which has been mostly focused on economic issues. Um, sadly, we lost Marianne Matsukatu to Sprue, but there you go. If you have very good people, they often get poached. But we have a set of economists here, um, and those economists are at the Open University are extremely grounded in real-life activities. They don't just model. Uh, so it was very important to have, for us to have those economies economists and also the international development people. But this is a five-minute video we're going to show you about the, about the Inogen research more generally. And after that, Chris will come up and he'll chair the rest of this morning, this afternoon. Make sure this works. Thank you. Inogen pioneers approaches that connect people, policy and practice to innovative solutions for real-world problems. We research in areas like emerging technologies such as cell therapies and synthetic biology. We research innovation systems, private ones certainly, but also public and most important public-private partnerships. And we research food and energy systems like biofuels. We want to know how we develop drugs for neglected diseases and new crops that can feed more people. We want to know if these new technologies deliver what they promise, and if so, if they can be delivered faster, cheaper, and more safely. Inogen's unique interdisciplinary approach brings together an understanding of how innovative value chains are developed and smarter, more adaptive regulatory processes are shaped, along with more effective engagement of the stakeholders that are affected by the new technologies. The bioeconomy is about delivering economic growth, but it's also about delivering on some of the social benefits like better health, prosperity and the environment and food security. Life science innovation depends on new ideas and discoveries, but the science and technology alone are not enough. Regulation, intellectual property, public perception are among the factors that can radically alter which products and services make it to market. At Inogen, we understand that innovation is a scientific as well as a social phenomenon. We analyze the scientific determinants of innovation's success so that the benefits of innovation can reach society in a timely manner. A 
Emerging technologies are largely based on promises about an unknown future. The nature of the technology is often contested and the outcomes of the technology are often uncertain. This leads to questions about how to govern the future. With emerging technologies, there's a danger they could be prematurely pushed down certain paths. For example, towards industrialization and commercialization and away from research for the public good. Governing the future is an area that Inogen is well placed to address. Inogen's work has shown us how complex innovation systems can become. So we take an evolutionary perspective. We look at how the history, context, knowledge and resource base of an individual region or sector can affect the system's development. Innovation and regulation go hand in hand. Innovation works really hard to understand the relationship between the two so that the safety is maintained and technological advances can save and improve the lives. When it comes to the good regulation, it's not a question of more or less, it's a question of appropriate and smart. Appropriate regulation is shaped by the clear social objectives designed to meet local needs. When this happens, you have more opportunity for success. At the turn of the last century, technological innovations in the agrochemical, biotechnology and seed industries were seen to have potential to address productivity, nutrition, storage and other constraints relating to food security the world over. Interactions and gaps in the policy, regulatory and market environments however discouraged or delayed progress. By working across sectors and advocating a multi-layered approach, Inogen helps countries explore options to successfully harness and govern these technologies. What's really exciting about Inogen is the way that it's brought together the life sciences with the social sciences. And it's done that in a way that's not just academic, but it's real in terms of developing policy and delivering practice. This is so important in the global economy, and Inogen is at the leading edge of delivering on that effective growth. Success helps economies grow and improve, and people lead better lives. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you to um, David and, and the organisers for, for inviting me to, to chair. Um, I like the fact that my life is split between Milton Keynes and Edinburgh. I spend as much time in London as, as I spend in, in Edinburgh. Um, I think that last comment you know, about better lives is, is the bottom line for it all, really, in, in my day job. Um, and I'm sometimes reminded, and I'll tell you about, a quote that I use that, that came from Graham Bullfield, who's also a member of the um, advisory group for Energen. And at the time, Graham was on a platform at the Roslyn Institute. They had a big event. He was director of the Roslyn at the time. Big event and a marquee outside. And I don't actually remember the question that he was asked, but I do remember the answer. The answer was something like this. It's like this, folks. You're now at the start of the biological revolution. It's a lot like the industrial revolution. It just happens faster and has far greater impact on all our lives. And I think that's true. So that's one of the reasons I find it so exciting to, to do the job that I do, which is trying to build these uh, links between commercial activity and, and the brilliant, brilliant UK biosciences. And one of the frustrations in doing that is sometimes to see this technology and, and just know that the first place it's going to be commercialised is outside Europe. And that's really frustrating. So when and how did we develop our Luddite tendencies and what do we do about them? You know, that's coming from a... a perspective of how do we get benefit from our science in the broadest possible sense. And so I've learned a lot over the time that I've um, worked with Inogen in, in various ways. Um, going back a, a long time, I found myself helping Inogen with the odd project, and there was one that was very enjoyable uh, done for the European Commission that ended up with a, a Nature Biotech paper in 2007. 
um, that the start of the title was Dolly for Dinner. Um, and it was about commercialization of, of uh, animal biotechnologies and, and what the current state of play was. And that, that relationship that we have with Inogen continues. Uh, it's really been valuable to uh, have many, many conversations with Dave and Joyce and others, uh, uh, groups that we meet, such as the Synthetic Biology Leadership Council. Um, David Castle is very much helping uh, the Synthetic Biology Leadership Council explore areas of standards and, and um, intellectual property in synthetic biology. What's the system that we have? Is it fit for purpose? How does it help or hinder the commercialization of, of synthetic biology? So um, that's enough of an introduction from me. Um, I'm not going to read people's biographies as, uh, as they come up because you've got those and that's a waste of your time and my time. Um, I, this is the very first time that I have chaired a program um, of so many social scientists with such a tight time scale. So I expect to learn something today. As someone who's used to chairing natural scientists, I expect to learn how good social scientists are at keeping to time. <laughs> um, so with that, I better turn to my program um, and work out who's first. Um, so it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Adrian Olsop, who's, who's on his way up to the lectern already, uh, from ESRC. Over to you, Adrian. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope people always say that, but it is a genuine pleasure uh, to be at this stage of celebrating a decade and looking ahead to future opportunities and where things go from here. Um, now, if this system works, there's a few, just a few slides that I can do. Don't worry, it's only a couple of slides. Um, and that one's self-explanatory, of course. Um, but the thing I want to stress, first of all, is that Inogen was doing excellence with impact before it was fashionable. Yeah? So in excellence with impact is the Research Council's collective strap line. I wish I'd thought of it, um, but never mind, because it is an aspiration about excellent science that will make a difference in the way Chris and earlier David and other colleagues were describing. Um, some of you will know the Research Councils at the moment are being looked at through what is strangely known as a triennial review, though the last one was some five or six years ago. Um, it's not for me to uh, announce the outcome or anything of that kind, but I think I can promise you that uh, a premium, an ever-increasing premium, will be placed upon collaboration and cooperation between the research councils. And in what better, more appropriate area is that than the life sciences? I can quite easily see how all of the bodies on that, or, uh, on that uh, slide will offer opportunities to the Institute going forward. And you'll see I've got on there the seven research councils, but also the Technology Strategy Board, which is increasingly active in this space, increasingly working effectively in partnership with the other side of the car park, which is all that keeps us apart, the research councils. And I think you'll find that there's a range of opportunities for uh, the Institute to take advantage of that. Um, a little bit of pragmatism there. Um, the way things work is that uh, settlements for the science base tend to come out in terms of what the phrase is flat cash. Flat cash, of course, means a real terms constraint. Obviously, we're grateful that it's not worse. But actually, the Technology Strategy Board is probably well positioned to gather a wind of more money if and when that becomes available from the public purse. So there's an instrumental reason for keeping that connection, but I would underline the importance of the actual partnerships and the benefits of connection in terms of excellence with impact over and above that instrumental dimension. A um, little slide from ESRC is that over the years we've come to unpack impact to identify at least four dimensions. And you can see an instrumental impact of a kind of, uh, like something that's patentable or a policy design. And uh, Inogen has made 
uh, difference to businesses and in terms of business models and in terms of policies in Scotland, in the UK and internationally. Um, and you can see those kind of instrumental impacts and that's great and we celebrate those and we capture those and we look forward to more of them. Um, but that of course is only part of the story. A huge impact is made by people flow. Where do the research assistants, where do the students go, uh, where do indeed do the visiting fellows go? I see one of them is now one of my fellow directors of research, so that's, uh, that's a great thing. So keep the focus on the people flow as well as the instrumental. But even more important than that, perhaps, is the conceptual impacts. When research changes the way a problem is framed. Um, and perhaps the huge example of that from science of the last 20 years is the uh, notion that climate change is anthropogenic and the way that that has been set out by IPCC, drawing on three, four decades of scientific research in that conceptual impact. But the one I want to focus on in just the last couple of minutes is networked capability. We've noticed over the years that when we've invested in an area uh, for five or ten years and that particular grant has come to an end, actually five, ten, fifteen years later, the people are still working to each other, with each other. They're still connecting with policy and practice. They're still using the networks they made during that to make instrumental people flow and conceptual impacts. So that's an impact of its own, a networked capability, if you like. And I'm absolutely sure that the Inogen as an institute will be a kind of networked capability impact of Inogen as a research centre as we've had it. Um, just a small slide, that just because you've had 10 years of money from us as a research centre doesn't mean you can't have any more. Um, there will be a number of opportunities that the ESRC uh, puts up and about, uh, which you can take advantage of over the next few years. Just to highlight a couple, the one on the science or science of environmental change down there, we're shortly to have a push on environmental regulation, and uh, it would be odd if the expertise from Inogen were not deployed there. Last time I was in Milton Keynes, we were talking about inclusive innovation as an issue, and we've been talking to our Indian counterparts about work in that space. Um, we have and intend a big push on innovation in health and social care and opportunities there for the life sciences part of Inogen's work on innovation and business models there and healthcare systems, of course. And, of course, you'll have noticed that we've been spending rather large amounts of capital in the first instance on big data, but having set up that infrastructure, it will be important to make sure that infrastructure is used and I'm sure Inogen researchers will come up with bright ideas there. But first of all, this is not an exhaustive list. There will be other, other things too. And yes, of course, Inogen is also welcome in our responsive competitions as well. Just because you've had a centre doesn't debar you from those kind of competitions. And that's just the ESRC slide. Um, if you think back to the way the industrial strategy is evolving, if you think to the way the leadership councils are evolving, there will be biz opportunities, there will be TSB opportunities, there will be opportunities that cross the research councils and indeed cross the research councils, TSB and business. So we're at the start rather than at the end. So thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing much more uh, networked capability from Inogen going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody knew that they could apply for money, but it's still a relief to hear it, isn't it? <laughs> you know. um, so uh, next up, um, uh, we have our own uh, member of the House of Lords with us today. Um, so it's a pleasure to uh, introduce um, Baroness Margaret Sharp. I'm not here really as a member of the House of Lords. I was very flattered to be asked to come and help launch the Energen Institute. But I think I'm here... Um, as much because I've been involved in this area for a very long time. Um, I was one of the... In my, when I, I joined Spru, which was in 1981, one of the first areas that I got involved with was the emerging biotechnology in those days. And I was thinking back. I mean, it was 
actually now 30 years since I published the little monograph, which was entitled The New Biotechnology, European Governments in Search of a Strategy. Because what I found was when I went round and talked to everybody, that they all said, this is a vital area that we've got to be involved with. You know, enormous, the scientific um, impetus at that time was enormous as it is now. I mean, it has continued to be enormous. But everybody sort of said, but we don't know really what we should be doing to promote it and to commercialise it and so forth. And it was, a, a, you know, quite an interesting experience. And it led me um, on to do further work. I mean, I, I, I um, worked, I did a, two evaluations which were enormously valuable to me as, as a, a researcher in this area. One was the um, biotechnology directorate that the old SERC had set up, and which in many senses I mean, you know, was a precursor to so many of the industry university collaborations that we see today. And uh, uh, perhaps even more uh, specific was the Protein Engineering Club, because that was um, <laughs> a very real industry university collaboration. And um, had some very interesting, I mean, most of the time um, we had the MRC sort of shooting cannonballs um, at, at, at the Protein Engineering Club because there's, I, and I remember going to see Sidney Brenner and Sidney Brenner saying, um, as far as I'm concerned, biotechnology is me, um, more or less, and um, but basically that the SERC should be doing any work in this area is appalling. Um, it, and, and the general line taken by the MRC at that time was that any work that was commissioned by industry was by definition, um, w w you know, if it wasn't curiosity-led research, it must be bad research. So we had great, pro you know, the, 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 to some extent, Protein Engineering Club is a, um, the, the, the re evaluation we did of it or the report we did about it was to, to some extent justifying uh, the, the line taken and justifying the quality of the research that was undertaken. But in the process, as I say, I, I mean, it led me to meet a number of people who've been deeply involved with Inogen ever, ever and, and, and since. I mean, in particular, I remember my very first research student at Sprue, Wendy Faulkner, went up to Edinburgh and worked with Joyce. So I got to meet Joyce Tate. Um, I met David Weald very early on, and 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 we, you know, we we worked together on what <coughs> what was happening within the world. Joanna Chatterway is another person I've known for a very long time. You saw Jane Culvert. I don't know whether Jane's here, is she? Um, on on your thing, and again, Jane was a close colleague at Sprue, and I worked very closely with her. So my membership of the House of Lords comes, I think, third in the reasons as to why, why you've got me here today. Um, it has been interesting, as a member of the Science Technology Select Committee, seeing the way in which academic research is used in, uh, in, in government um, and the way it isn't used in government. I mean, to some extent, I find select committees actually a bit frustrating. As a researcher myself, I actually like to sit down and do, if you like, my um, review of the literature when we enter a topic. But you don't do, the select committees don't do the review of the literature. We rely on our specialist advisors to do that and to tell us what we need to know. Um, and our clerks, to some extent, do a great deal of the work. I mean, one of the lovely things about this is, is that you have these first-rate minds as clerks, and rather than having to write the stuff yourself, you'll find that the clerk produces it. I've, I chaired one of the subcommittees once, and it was really marvellous to have that. So let me just sort of tackle um, two issues, really, in the, the time I've got left. Secondly, how important is social science research for the biotech and the life sciences? It seems to me that over the course of time, scientists have begun to value social science. And I think this is particularly so where they have worked with somebody um, of the social sciences. 
uh, I instanced the Protein Engineering Club, and I think that by the time I had finished it, that quite a number of the scientists I was working with actually valued the input that I could make to, the, to, to, to their research and, and what we were doing and, um, and, and, and looking at it perhaps more objectively. My daughter is doing a lot of work in environmental science, and she works in water management and water resource management. And again, she has been working close, closely with engineers and the, what's called the Pennine Water Club. And uh, my impression is that they now, you know, they, they require a scientist to work along with them. So, um, and if we look at this whole issue of the public understanding of science, um, I think we have begun to get scientists to move away from the deficit model, as, as, as we used to call it, of the, the reason why... Um, social scientists are, um, are, are not valuable, at least the, the reason why public, the, the public take a particular line on science is because they don't understand it and we've got to fill that void of knowledge. Whereas, I mean, particularly in some areas of biotech, we found that the more the public understood it, the, 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 the more they were embedded in views that they held. Um, I was looking at the work that you've been doing recently, and I was struck by the work that Joyce has been doing on the governance issues. I think these are enormously interesting because there are questions, and in the Select Committee, one of the questions we've been raising is this whole question, have we carried the precautionary motive too far? Um, do we need to backpedal a little bit on it now? And I was very interested to see that Joyce was suggesting that perhaps we now um, have moved from a position in which um, the, the regulatory system was dominated too much by industry and, uh, and industry pressure groups to move into one in which it's been dominated by public voices. And there is a huge debate that needs to take place within Europe on the GMOs and where we are with GMOs. Because in all conscience, agricultural technology... Um, biotechnology, the, the application of biology to, to, to agriculture, productivity agriculture, was an area that Europe used to be leading the world in. And we are now not leading the world. This was a point that David was making at the beginning. And I think that there are huge issues to be coped with there. Which really brings me to the other area of Inogen's competence, which is that of global competences and how important this is. And how desperately, if we are to feed the 9 to 10 billion that we'll have to be feeding by 2050, we need to be able to use those scientific competences as best we can. The productivity in agriculture is absolutely vital to this. We cannot afford to sacrifice more forest land um, at a time when climate change and environmental pressures are so huge upon us. Um, and, you know, this was... It's, it's John Beddington's perfect storm, and I don't know how many of you have read... The I, I think really brilliant foresight study that came out on um, f the future of food and farming, which in, in another of my colleagues at Spru, Sandra Thomas, who works with foresight, was 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 um, in many senses responsible for. So let me finish my time by taking up the issue of the impact on um, sort of of, of institutions such as Innovation and Spru on government. I'm somewhat overwhelmed by the amount of, um, of, of, of research that government now commissions, the amount of paper or the amount of virtual paper that now comes into government in terms of reports. And I find myself despairing somewhat at the fact that while the research is there, the evidence is there, decisions that are taken are seldom based on evidence. I mean, perhaps I feel very strongly or hard about this because one of the areas that I speak on in the House of Lords is education. And my goodness, is there, is there a lot of evidence there? But does our Secretary of State take any notice of it? Not as far as I can see. Um, and this is true. I mean, you have to look at the badger cull, where again, you know, the evidence is there and yet government has gone ahead. And it is very depressing. And it is very depressing because essentially it is the short-termism of parliamentarians and ministers. And I think this is something where perhaps we social scientists have to really work quite hard. I was quite struck by, just come back from three weeks in Germany, by the degree to which the Germans do seem to have made 
and developed a balance here between the short and the longer term. Um, and that the decisions that are taken both by government in Germany but also by the other institutions in Germany to, can focus on the, the shorter term. So let me finish again by congratulating Inogen, uh, the Inogen Centre, on what they have achieved over the last 10 years and wishing them very well indeed for the next 10 years. Um, it, 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 um, it, it's a risky route that they're adopting, but I think it's with all kinds of challenges. But as Adrian indicated in what he had to say, there, are, there is help as well outside there. And I'm, they are, it seems to me that they are well positioned to take advantage and to exploit the challenges that are there. Thank you very much. Um, I'm one of those people who's always quite impressed by the quality of the debate in one house versus another. Um, reach your own conclusions as to which one has the better quality of debate. Um, the two things that you, you mentioned made, uh, struck home to me. One was, the yes, the Foresight Report is fantastic. And there is a comment in there, I won't get it exactly right, which says... Um, we've taken the precautionary principle a bit too far, and one of the things that we fail to assess is the risk of doing nothing. And I think that's really quite important, uh, and we ignore it sometimes. And the other comment was that um, we were having a discussion outside earlier about the difficulties of engaging with the Medical Research Council, so sometimes not much changes. <laughs> um, so next up... Um, and again, I'm not going to read a full biography, but um, if you've read it or scanned it, you will see that um, our next speaker, Professor Miles Wickstead, has a fantastic uh, international perspective. Uh, and uh, I imagine he's going to be sharing some of that with us, but I don't know for sure. Over to you, Miles. Hi, everyone. Um, I think I'm going to pick up the theme of better lives, actually, which is what um, two or three people have already referred to as being the kind of core guiding principle of Inogen. And I have three sets of points that I'm going to make, even though I'm not French, you know, who always do things in threes, but I'm going to do, use, use that sort of tripartite principle anyway. So the first thing I want to talk briefly about is, is the last job that I did in government, which was running something called the Commission for Africa, um, the results of which fed into the Glen Eagles uh, Summit in 2005. Uh, I ran the Secretariat for the Commission for Africa, working very closely with... Uh, Nick Stern, who was Director of Policy and Research um, uh, for, the, for the Commission, who went on the following year, of course, to do his great report on, on, uh, on climate change. And we had quite a lot to say in the Commission for Africa report about governance. And we talked about governance not just about being corrupt politicians and people putting money into their own pockets, but about capability, capacity, of governments uh, in Africa, particularly, uh, not just having the will to be able to do things in a way which ensure that public money went to public services, but have the capacity to do it as well. And that meant that you had to build up human capacity and institutional capacity. You needed to have doctors, you needed to have nurses, you needed to have teachers, but you also needed to have scientists. You also needed people who kind of understood soil science, uh, people who understood uh, uh, water. And we had a series of recommendations in the Commission for Africa report about the need to strengthen science and technology in Africa. Nick, who'd spent a lot of time working on India, was very keen that Africa kind of should kind of establish a, a network of science and technology institutes uh, across uh, Africa. That kind of got slightly lost in the final version of the report and didn't really get fed into the uh, Glen Eagles um, communicate in a very strong way. But I think what we can say is that since 2005, there has been an increasing recognition within Africa of the importance of science and technology for Africa's future. If it doesn't have the capacity and capability in those human terms, how is it going to be able to shape its own destiny? It's really important to, to build that up. And kind of Inogen was already there. You know, Indigen had already been there for two or three years when we did that report, so Indigen gets a, a tick in that box. The second point I want to make is that um, one of the things I think we did with the Commission for Africa report again was to, was to regenerate some momentum behind the Millennium Development Goals. 
you will all be familiar with those, uh, generated in 2000, 2001. And it goes back again to the theme of better lives that, that, um, that has been picked up. The overarching goal being to halve the proportion of people living in absolute poverty uh, in the world, but also a number of health outcomes and education uh, outcomes about more children living to the age of five, about fewer mothers dying in childbirth. And the truth is that we have made terrific progress against those Millennium Development Goals. Actually, we have halved the proportion of people living in absolute poverty in the world. There's a bigger population, but we have halved the proportion of people living in, in absolute poverty. There are fewer mothers dying in childbirth. More children are going to school. More children are living to see their fifth birthdays before. And again, you know, a lot of that advance comes down to some of the advances that Inogen has been, has been working on, bio, biotechnology advances. And there's still, of course, a huge amount of work to do uh, in this area. You know, by definition, if you halve the proportion of living, people living in absolute poverty, you've still got some way to go. If you reduce the number of mothers living in, in uh, um, dying in, in childbirth, uh, you still have a, a ways to go after that. So there is a big job to be done uh, in the future. And I will, I will come on to say a little bit about that as my kind of closing third set of comments. But there's one other element about the existing set of Millennium Development Goals, which, which have been rather underestimated, really, and that's MDG 8 of these eight goals, which is about global partnerships for development. It's about how people work together better to address these issues, which are about essentially creating better lives not just about public sector, not just about governments, bringing the private sector into this uh, debate and discussion as well. And again, you know, I think Inogen can put a tick in that box too. It's done some very innovative stuff about working closely with business, uh, private sector as well, uh, bringing these different actors together. And that's going to be such an important part of what happens um, uh, in whatever succeeds the Millennium Development Goals. My third set of points is really that that debate and discussion has already started. Some significant um, uh, meetings in New York um, uh, three or four weeks ago uh, on the basis of a high-level panel report of which the British Prime Minister was, was, was um, a, a part reporting on what should, what comes after 2015 look like. And the world has changed, if you think about it, an awful lot since 2000 largely because of the financial crash in 2008. What's a developed country now? What's a developing country? You know, all these definitions have, have gone down. And actually, the more you think about it, the more what we understand is that we have a common set of issues, a common set of problems that need to be addressed. I think that the set of goals that are going to come after 2015 will have three key pillars to it. One pillar is about development, as we have traditionally understood it, largely around economic growth, etc. The second pillar is about going to be putting a stronger emphasis on the people who've been left out, the most vulnerable groups, women, girls, children, people from ethnic minorities, people with disabilities. How, how, do, we, how do we address their issues? How do, we, how do we put in place policies which are going to make sure that nobody gets left behind? And then the third set of issues is around environment, climate change, etc. You know, what happened in 1987 with the Brundtland report, and Mrs. Brundtland herself absolutely understood the risk of this. You know, they produced this wonderful report, and she said in the forward, there is a real risk that the development people are going to go off in one direction and the environment people are going to go off in a completely different direction. And she, you know, that's absolutely what has happened. People don't talk to each other. These have gone off on separate threads. Well, now there is a real potential, I think, for bringing it um, uh, back uh, together again uh, and understanding that these are parts of the same set of issues. You know, what is the point of improving the quality of someone's life if their home is going to be washed away because of climate change? And so we have a set of interconnected issues that, that we're all going to have to address Climate change, perhaps the most obvious of those, health issues. 
you know, health doesn't stop, health issues don't, and problems don't stop at national boundaries. I think, you know, the risk of, uh, everybody in the room is much better qualified to talk about this than, than I am, but the risk of, you know, serious pandemics which, which cross borders and, and, you know, could result in the loss of, of millions in lives is, is, you know, we're only one step a, ahead of the curve, uh, I think. Um, so a lot of issues there which, which affect all of us and which are going to be equal problems that we all need to address together, even if it's just issues like, you know, where do we get economic growth from? Where do we get jobs from? But I think most uh, dramatically around, around issues of, of, of climate change, um, environmental uh, pollution, the loss of biodiversity. And again, I think, you know, Indigen gets a tick in that box, absolutely understands that set of issues, uh, is working in a very collaborative way uh, internationally as well as, as, as nationally. So I think you're in a really good place after 10 years. You've kind of got the, the people, you've got the, uh, the, the notions, the framework, um, and I wish you, as Margaret has done, I wish you every success over the next 10 years as you take forward this mission of bringing people together, creating better lives, and addressing common problems uh, for the benefit of all of us. Thank you. Nice reminder that, that uh, those of us with full stomachs need to remember those who don't have full stomachs as well when it comes to our decision making. Um, so uh, I've learned something. Actually, the three guest speakers have been fantastic at keeping to time. Um, next up comes uh, the Inogen team. Uh, Peter Robbins and David Castle, double act, um, and we'll see whether they can continue the trend. Thank you. Okay, that doesn't count in my time allotment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're a double act, David Castle with me, Peter Robbins. Uh, it's fantastic to see you all here, and I'm delighted to be here at the Open University. I'm going to try to keep my remarks uh, very short so that uh, uh, the Open University uh, crew has the uh, has the mic for most of, of today. Uh, but being based in Edinburgh, and working with people at the Open University is, is a great pleasure, and it allows us to actually develop this incredible interdisciplinary network that we, uh, that we call Inogen. And so I really want to impress upon you that um, uh, we've, heard, we've heard many things so far eloquently stated about the, the areas of impact and the social relevance of, of Inogen, and we are certainly going to tell you a little bit more about that in our uh, plans for uh, for the future, but what I really want to impress upon you as well is that there is a way of working in a community of researchers uh, that collaborate to make the, all of this actually happen. And I think that one of the most important value propositions around around Inogen uh, is in fact this mode of working, this highly networked, highly interdisciplinary uh, approach to synthesizing research, teaching. And, and impact, and that's the value proposition that we think sustains Inogen into the future. And so I suppose if um, Peter and I are the F1 generation, then we have to thank the wild types, Joyce, Dave, and Joanna, for having uh, set up this multi-generational uh, possibility for us to exploit. Um, there's another person, though, I think, um, who uh, is running all the way through what we are going to say now in terms of helping us get this message clear, concise, packaged attractively, and that's Elizabeth Barlow, who has been working with us uh, uh, in Inogen for the past couple of years as our uh, policy and communications officer. And although she was hired on to the ESRC Center grant, we have been strategically leveraging that grant, you'll be happy to know, <laughs> uh, in order to be able to project what was the ESRC Center into the future as it becomes the uh, Inogen Institute. So you've heard what, we've, what we do with respect to um, all of the life sciences, emerging technologies, global development, health, and, and so on and so forth. That is all going to continue into the, into the future. But what I really want to, uh, to say about this, and this is where Elizabeth has played such a huge role in, in our thinking about the future, she's really helped us to actually consolidate this into uh, a number of thematic areas where we intend to actually have rel relevance and coverage and, and impact 
Uh, so through working on research projects, of course, but uh, publishing and getting into um, different kinds of public and stakeholder engagement events, and really providing that evidence basis uh, for advice and consultation that's so desperately needed to make informed, wise, forward-thinking uh, decisions. So we've we've done all of all of the, all of that, but at the same time, we've also managed to uh, develop a coherent picture of what it is that the 40 or so uh, full-time researchers between two universities in addition to uh, the 30 or so other affiliates that, that we work very closely with, we've learned how to package this uh, into uh, a number of themes that you can actually see here. And I think it would be, be a terrible waste of time and very didactic of me to go through all of these things. What I want to signal to you, though, is that we now have a very consistent message and brand around all of the work that we are uh, doing now and in the future, uh, which I would, I would suggest to you, you, you might go and look at our, our website, Inogen, uh, dot, dot AC, dot UK because it's on that website there that you will actually see the full picture as it interrelates between who's doing the research, who are the people that are doing the research with which funds, with which partners, internationally or domestically, and so on and so forth. And so I would really encourage you to go and look at, at, at what we're doing. This, of course, is our, our institutional structure, where we're based and how we function. But really, the most important thing from, from my perspective is, is that we've, we've dealt with, I think, a, a, a potential uh, and, and potentially very serious threat, which is that at the end of 10 years of ESRC center funding, uh, it's actually conceivable that uh, a center can simply disappear into the vapor of, of academic enterprises. And what we've done is we've managed now uh, to convince um, our mutual uh, administrations uh, that Inogen is something that ought to be con continued into the future. Uh, so we've done that in parallel and we have now actually stitched those two parallel uh, arguments for the future of Inogen together with a memorandum of understanding between uh, uh, Edinburgh and the Open University. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity for us uh, to go forward in the future, especially around the research areas now that my colleague Peter is going to describe. Thanks, David. Well, it's great. Uh, I just want to echo you know, what David and others have said, um, that we can continue this long collaboration between our two universities, and particularly thanks to Joyce and Dave and Joanna and many people and the colleagues who came down Alessandro from Edinburgh, uh, it's, it's really great. And um, at the moment, what's, what I have my head in at the moment is, in addition to Elizabeth, who saved me several times, there were anxious phone calls going up to Edinburgh from me as well. Dave mentioned this to, Ed, to Elizabeth, who helped a lot with this event. But um, what's really in my head at the moment is what we're doing in our REF submission, um, because I'm leading that as, as well. And this is... Uh, what 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 I uh, get from all of this is the is the amazing sense of uh, human capital that I think uh, Adrian touched on the people uh, and the networks that we're involved with and and what I just come away with is what what a great bunch of people that I work with and what fantastic uh, research people are doing and um, with all the uh, the anxieties that come with the REF um, and and some <laughs> with managing a research center, uh, this is really the thing that it's all about. So this slide uh, gives an overview of some of the areas that we're, we're working in. And I just wanted to highlight some of our colleagues who are working in these areas. And, um, you know, one is, is, uh, is emerging technologies and uh, Colleagues Dinar, Kale, and Farah Hosea are doing work around uh, this in biosimilars and medical devices, and how do you regulate uh, um, these these new technologies in developing countries? Uh, Farah Hosea and I worked on uh, Central and Eastern Europe um, biotechnology innovation. How do accession countries deal with new technologies, and how? How do, we, how do we grapple with those things, and what, what kind of lessons can we learn? Um, there are a whole set of people who doing work on agriculture and environment. Um, Theo Papianu and Les Levado are doing uh, work on bioenergy. Uh, and Norman Clark is, uh, is doing work with uh, 
DFID on uh, uh, research into use on practical applied projects, uh, for example, army worm in Tanzania and Kenya and biocontrol agents and how they can, uh, how, how we can improve uh, alleviation of, um, of biological problems in those places and, and also uh, uh, lend uh, new innovative strategies. Um, oops. In global health and development, uh, our colleague um, Maureen McIntosh, who's, who's away at the moment, has this uh, DF, DFID SRC projects and looking at health sector uh, performance for inclusive health. And there are a whole set of people who work on inclusive innovation. Joanna Chataway and Rafi Koblinski is here as well. They've been working on below the radar innovation. And um, this, is, this is an area I think I was glad to see that Adrian uh, was pointing out that this is an emerging area of interest for ESRC. Um, we do work on innovation systems, a whole set of different projects. And again, I'm just touching on, on some different things. Uh, Julius McGuagua, who you saw in the video, has a Future Leaders ESRC project on innovative spending in health, looking at Kenya and South Africa. Uh, Joe Chataway and um, Becky Hanlon have been working on product development partnerships in health and how this is now being taken up through a welcome uh, trust initiative through the African Union to evaluate capacity building in this area through the new Partnership for Africa's Development. Um, so this is just a small selection of, of projects. Uh, life science governance and engagement um, Joyce, Tate, Dave Wield, uh, and Joe Chataway were involved in a OECD futures project on the bioeconomy to 2030 and looking at the ways in which regulation strongly in influences what kinds of life science products are developed and, and which are carried forward. Uh, colleagues like Sue Arestian is working on uh, farmers and other stakeholders' understanding uh, of GM crops. Um, so again, this is just, just a selection of projects, but you can see that we, we have uh, 40 institutions across 30 countries, and um, we are, are mapping this impact, uh, as I say, uh, in the REF process, um, in terms of how this has had influence in industry and government and public bodies, not only in Europe, but also internationally. So I think that, um, I guess my, my message is that, that, that uh, I so appreciate the, the history of, of our group, the, what's now the Inogen Institute, and I have um, great confidence in the future based on uh, what fantastic colleagues and projects we have going. Thank you. Thank you. As you've probably gathered, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of, of Inogen Institute. I'm a fan of what uh, Inogen has done uh, and what it can go on to do. Um, I'm also um, a fan of the benefits of that multidisciplinarity and, and not all of the, um, I'll use an expression that does mean something in biology but could be misinterpreted, um, not all of the wet biologists I meet um, are actually as convinced as, as, as I am and as you are about the, the value of doing that. So we, we constantly have this debate about how do you ask better questions, uh, how do you explain the results better, uh, and how do you frame better routes to, to market for your technology, because we can do the whole thing a lot more efficiently if we actually take a bigger picture view of things. Um, so I want to thank uh, all of the speakers for um, staying uh, very much to time and for their fantastic insights. Um, I want to say congratulations to Inogen uh, on the 10 years or 10 and a bit years uh, and all the best for the future. And I will now hand you over to another local, uh, travelled very slightly f a greater distance than me, um, Tim Blackman, who's the PVC here, for the closing remarks. Thanks very much. And for, for those who... who don't know me, I'm, I'm Tim Blackman, I'm Pro Vice-Chancellor for Research Scholarship and Quality here at the Open University. And it's my job, I think, to keep you from your lunch, um, but more importantly, it's my privilege to thank our speakers today for, um, I think, uh, so efficiently and effectively sharing their insights and thoughts 
with us, um, and indeed for their support that they've given to Inogen, which is hugely appreciated. Um, I'm really pleased that the OU's been able to support Inogen right from the beginning, um, and I'm particularly appreciative of the fact that the Economic and Social Research Council had the confidence in the OU as a co-host for a major investment. Um, and over the last 10 years, we've really grown up as an institution in that regard here at the OU. Uh, we've hosted several major research council and research charity investments over that period. Indeed, one of the most recent we only got confirmation about last week, we'll be hosting a major £16 million smart city project here in Milton Keynes, working with partners on a really exciting range of activity, uh, playing to that whole smart city big data agenda. Um, so these things keep on coming. And indeed, only last week we also heard uh, that we had been successful in not just one, but two um, research training, doctoral training consortia with the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the £17 million uh, Chase Consortium in Humanities and the Design Star. So collaboration certainly is the way forward in doctoral training and research generally, and we're very much up for that at the Open University and very excited about the way we can play in our own cyber infrastructure to these collaborations and the whole e-research and digital scholarship agenda. For me, I don't need to say anything to this audience about how important um, Inogen is. Uh, for me, two things have been significant. One is its role in thinking about innovation. Everybody's talking about innovation today, but, in, but Inogen is asking some really searching questions about what kind of innovation, innovation where, innovation for whom. And these are not just um, interesting academic questions, they're fundamental questions about the kind of societies that people live in and that we ourselves live in. So the impact aspect and the engagement aspect, hugely important in bringing those questions to bear. Um, the second point I'd like to make uh, about Inogen is its interdisciplinarity, and it has really helped the Open University to learn how to do interdisciplinarity better. Uh, I think Inogen has the scars on its back in many regards, in, regards in, in helping us to understand how to do that. It's something I appreciate. Um, and we're still not good enough. We still need to get better. I just came this morning from a meeting with the new National Centre for Universities and Business, where yet again interdisciplinarity was being talked about as a problem, you know, that, that companies don't know where to go to find where's the best research in the UK in, in energy or in big data or in innovation. What, where they can go is to the RE and the REF, where we tell them about research quality discipline by discipline, but not in the... Um, sense that many companies need to know it. And I think the research councils have been tremendously helpful in this regard in actually challenging us at the OU and in the higher education sector generally to work across disciplines, to be interdisciplinary. And that demand pool is, is, is very, very important. Um, I'd like to, to, as well to, to note how important the relationship with Edinburgh University has been for us, for perfectly obvious reasons, but um, it's an important relationship it's going to continue to flourish um, in the new, through the new institute, but it has other dimensions that in, in large measure are also a legacy of, of Inogen and, the, in a sense, the trust that a relationship like that has brought. So, for example, FutureLearn, Edinburgh is a partner in FutureLearn, and we've, we're having some really uh, fruitful discussions with Edinburgh U University about doctoral training as well. Um, so I think we can look forward to a really positive future for Inogen in terms of its research, its agenda setting and groundbreaking research, its impact, influence, and indeed networked capability, uh, which is the word I picked up this morning. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so that's really exciting. And um, just finally to say to everybody, thank you for coming along, and please do stay and have some lunch with us. <laughs>